hello to everyone. Um, so my name is Olga Simonova and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Georgia Tech. And primarily I'm working in the School of Biology, but also collaborating with the School of Interactive Computing. And it's very nice to be here. I had several interesting um, meetings this morning and I'm very excited to talk to you about my research project. And um, I will present mainly two, two different <laughs> two different projects, um, one of which is uh, my uh, PhD research project <coughs> and another is my current, uh, the current project on which I'm working at Church Attack. And one has uh, direct applications in computer graphics and another in computational biology. And as you will see, uh, at the first glance they might look quite different, but in reality they have a lot of common, um, common problems. Um, the purpose of the first, of the first pro pro project was uh, shape analysis for the purpose of the retrieval of 3D models from, from data sets of 3D objects. And the purpose of the second project is shape analysis for the purpose of mapping genotype to phenotype. And what it means exactly I will, I will explain in, in, during my presentation. So within these two projects, we have similar problems. Um, in, the, in the first project, we try to design some shape descriptor so that we can use it for shape retrieval purposes. In the other project, we are interested in computing different, different we call them traits, different features of the shape that we can use to characterize, describe an object, which is biological object, and in this particular project, it is uh, root architecture of plants. Another, another similarity is that uh, in the first project we tried to match shapes in order to retrieve them from the database based on their similarity. And in other, we want to estimate uh, similar features between objects from different varieties and also between the object reconstruction uh, at different time steps. In computer graphics, we often want to create some animation from a given set of uh, control, con control frames. And in computational biology, we want to reconstruct some continuous dynamic process given a discrete set of observations. Uh, in computer graphics, we have uh, compressed or missing data, and the data in biology is usually corrupted by quite severe noise. And finally, uh, in computer graphics projects, problems, we want sometimes to, to be able to label shapes. Uh, for example, we, if we can uh, segment a shape into components that represent the shape and using some local information, we probably can somehow infer labels uh, from other annotated objects. And finally, we probably can understand that the object represented by those labels is an uh, object of human in this example. In computation and biology, we are interested in answering questions about functional properties of a given shape. For example, if, if some plant has a particular root, we are interested in understanding whether this, this plant will be resistant to drought or will be responsive to nutrients or if it has a strong anchor. So I will uh, present both of the projects during my talk and I will start with uh, shape descriptor for 3D model uh, retrieval project, which is my PhD research project. So the goal of this project is to design some kind of shape descriptors that we can use in for retrieval uh, similar objects um, from from the database. And the idea is similar to have some search search engine engine, but instead of using verbal description as in standard um, search engines, we want to extract uh, topological or geometrical information from, from a given shape and use this information as a descriptor um, of an object that we have at hand. Um, and I want to give a brief overview of, of the frameworks that we use to retrieve models from the database. So given two, two different models, we are interested in, answer, in answering question how similar they are to, to estimate quantitatively their similarity. So in order to do that, we compute um, 
shaped scripture, which is in our case, is riprap, annotated riprap. And then I will explain how we can convert this representation to a matrix form and then to a vector. And then we use the distance between vectors to estimate similarity between original models. So in the first part of the talk, I will uh, describe what, what is the shape descriptor that we are using and how we construct it. Um, so uh, before I, I say that, I want to give a short overview of, of, of the field at, at the time I was working there. And the first family of shape descriptors that are used to estimate similarity between shapes is uh, distribution-based shape descriptors. So here, here you can see um, the distribution of the distance function evaluated on randomly sampled points on the shape. And this, this descriptor can work quite well for very simple shapes, but it tends to take the, sh the shape of the normal distribution as objects become more complex. The, other, the next class of uh, shape descriptors is transformation-based shape descriptors, which transform original shape into some frequency domain, and then usually low few low frequencies are used as a signature of, of the shape. Um, then view-based shape descriptor is, um, is a shape descriptor computed on, the, on 2D images of a 3D object. And finally, the, the, the final uh, class of shape descriptors that I would like to mention today is um, graph-based shape descriptors, and there are several methods here. So this, these descriptors give you a, a graph representation of the structure of the shape, and furthermore, they can be also um, annotated with some uh, additional information, such as local, local ge geometrical information about the shape. And um, here you can have um, thinning algorithm to, to produce a skeleton representation, rip graph based and recently proposed um, algorithm for skeleton extraction by mesh contraction. So the advantages I mentioned already, the advantage of these graph based shape descriptors is that they give you a global representation of the structure of the shape, while you can also store some additional information along with in the form of labels for edges or nodes of the graph. So in our research, we use strip graph based shape descriptor. So just to give you um, an idea what I'm talking about, uh, rip graph is, a, is defined as a quotient space of a manifold, where the manifold is represented in this project uh, by the surface of, a of the 3D model. And with respect to some gain function, um, it is defined by an equivalence relation where two, two, two points on the manifold are considered to be equivalent if, uh, if the mapping function takes the same values uh, on the manifold and also if these points belong to the same connected component. So what, what it means is, um, so in examples that I will show now, we are considering height mapping function. Um, so, in other words, recap how, what, what it means. Um, the two points of the manifold will be considered to be equivalent if, it, if um, the, they belong to the same level set of the mapping function and also if they belong to the same connected component of, of that particular level set. Then these two points will be considered equivalent and they will be represented by a single node in the read graph. Furthermore, we can simplify the read graph by removing all regular nodes with degree uh, equal to two and leaving just nodes uh, corresponding to critical areas of the mapping function, such as saddle region, regions of maximum and minimum. Uh, so there are several ways to construct uh, the rip graph, and the way I did it in my uh, PhD research project was by interactive bisection of branching regions and regions with non-zero genus. So this process starts by placing some seed number, which is usually low number, of level sets, which subdivides <coughs> the object into set of components. And the process proceeds by bisecting regions with, uh, with branching shape or with non-zero <coughs> genus until such complex regions reach some predefined um, small size. So on the next step, we want to merge adjacent components 
uh, that correspond to regular or extrema regions of the, of the mapping function. And these components can be, um, they, they are created on the previous bisection step. So at the, res at the result of this uh, bisection and merging steps, what we obtain is uh, kind of larger elongated segments for regular and extrema regions of, uh, of the mapping function while keeping the size of the branching components small. So at this point, we can construct now the rib graph where each component obtained after these two steps is represented by a node in the rib graph. And we, and we place the edge between nodes if the, if the segment that they represent are adjacent. We try to, to construct rib graph using different shape um, mapping functions. And here you can see um, height mapping functions, distance from better center, and um, in fact, it's a geodesic distance function. And um, as you can expect, um, better results are produced by using geodesic distance function because it's quite robust to, to different shape deformations le leading to similar uh, or equivalent uh, graph representation for, for the same uh, shape but in different postures. So, um, sorry, yes? So when you, when you use the geodesic mapping function, so So the advantage to have kind of prolonged regions corresponding to regular, uh, to regular and extrema regions is that we can use then, um, we can characterize their shape by looking at the evolution of level sets of the height mapping function defined locally on these regions. So using this approach, we, we can distinguish between um, shapes that have local, that locally have constant cross-sectional area, for example, or decreasing, increasing, or multiple uh, cross-sectional cross areas, or segments that, that are straight or have single or multiple bending, or um, segments with constant or multiple curvatures. And this work was published um, in 2007 in two different um, venues. Uh, so now I would like to talk about the second part of this project where we want to use this shape descriptor to retrieve 3D models uh, from, from the database. So I will describe now how we convert um, the graph representation of the shape, which can be annotated with some local shape information, to a matrix representation, and then to the vector representation. So, given the graph based shape descriptor, where we can store two different uh, local shape, uh, shape characteristics together with each edge, we can convert this matrix to a Hermitian matrix, which enters are defined by its formula, and here, um, a, a and B are, are vertices uh, in the graph, and W and Y are the two labels that are stored along with each edge. So this Hermitian matrix uh, tends to be also a Laplacian matrix if we can satisfy the following restriction on the, um, on the labels associated with each edge. And basically this this restriction say that the magnitude of the complex number uh, should be positive and should be uh, symmetric for adjacent vertices, and the phase of the complex number should be the same in absolute value, but have different, different sign for different directions of the edge, and it should be restricted to some, to some intervals. So if we can satisfy this property, then we can use Laplacian uh, 
Laplacian matrix and it's some useful properties for um, <coughs> for uh, using our um, descriptor and particularly we are interested in a filler vector of the Laplacian which is vector the eigenvector which is associated with second smallest eigenvalue of the Laplacian and it's known for its useful pro useful properties and applications in the fields like graph cl clustering or vertex ordering and in, in, our, in our work we use a uh, filler vector to cluster the graph into subgraphs in order to capture partial shape similarity and the way we did it is basically by identifying central nodes which are nodes that have high entry in in um, filler vector um, high entry in the filler vector and also high degree uh, high, high degree in the graph so we we did we did it to capture partial uh, similarities and then we also used this fiddler vector as a signature of both the whole graph and also subgraphs so we, we evaluated the distance between fiddler vectors and used that distance as indication for how similar original shapes are and so we, we also combined the values that we received as a result of whole, the whole graph matching and also subgraph matching and, and combined them into unique score that we used for shape retrieval. So we tested this approach on a um, SRAC database, which is um, of 2007, and this database is composed of 200 models, um, 20, uh, yeah, uh, no, 400 models, sorry, 20 classes of different objects and uh, 20, 20 objects per class. And here you can see two, two um, query results. And the query model is um, shown in the, on, the first, um, on the first place. And correct retrieval results are shown, are highlighted with green. So, um, Compared to state-of-the-art methods at that time, um, so the, the method that performed the best, um, I believe it was in 2000, yeah, 2007, uh, was also a method based on grip graph uh, shape descriptor and uh, using, uh, using exact graph matching for <coughs> estimating similarity between, between um, models. So compared to that, to, to that um, method, our our method was not the winning one, but uh, we, we are talking here about indexing methods for shape retrieval, where we use the distance between two vectors instead of graph matching algorithms. So it, it's faster, and we also found that compared to uh, the use of more standard real valued Laplacian uh, matrix, this approach gives better results because we can store two, two labels along with each edge. Um, so now I would like to um, switch gears a little bit and I will, um, the rest of my talk will be de dedicated to, to the project um, on which I'm working currently at Georgia Tech. And this is, um, this project is, um, the goal of this project is um, to analyze the shape for, um, in or the goal of this project is to understand genetic basis of fruit traits. And what it means exactly is that we would like to, ma to map gene expression or genotype to phenotype. So a genotype is a genetic sequence, and we are talking here about crop plants like rice and corn. So ge um, genetic sequence is known for these plants. And uh, we want to map expression of the genes to some features of the shape. So here we have genetic sequence, and we want to characterize the shape of, of the roots and to, to map expression to, to the feature values. So in order, usually the techniques that would do that are based on correlations. So in this case, the first part, which is a genetic sequence, is already known. So what is unknown is features that would describe the shape. So, and the problem, the problem in this project is that because natural 
growth environment is non-transparent, so it's, it's very, it, it creates an obstacle in accessing and ana analyzing this data. So my, my colleagues um, at Duke University, they uh, grow rice, rice plants in a transparent gel, and they observe the growth through 14 days, and they also grow um, rice of different varieties and try, so here you can see, um, I think, yeah, so here you can see nine different varieties and I think it's 14 stay of the growth, so the root architecture becomes very complex. And you can see that some of the varieties have very different, uh, have very different root architectures, where other varieties like Lament and Nippenbeer have very similar root architecture. And if you look for at some at, at the couple of specific images, it's very hard to, to say what are their distinct features, which image belong to which variety. It's very hard to, to estimate and to answer this question. So before we, we started our project, we wanted to answer the question whether there are uh, significant differences between root architectures of different, um, of different plants. And uh, in order to do that, we try to classify images that I show to you um, and, and see whether we can have some, some reasonable accuracy that we, will tell us that there are significant differences between shapes. And so in order to do that, we computed 16 different features from 2D images. And I listed here uh, all of them and illustrated some of them on this slide. Some of those features were standard uh, to plant physiology community that were usually computed by hand or just eyeball estimation approach. And some of them were new and we could compute them using our image analysis uh, approach. And we used la linear support vector machine to classify these this images. In this approach, each image is represented as a point in 16 dimensional space where each coordinate, a coordinate is equal to, um, to the features that we computed. And um, Lanier support vector machine tries to fit a maximum margin separating hyperplane that, that would um, separate these two images in, in two classes. So here in, in this particular example, the space is represented by the two features, for example, solidity and depth, and each point represents an image and colors correspond to two different varieties. So we use, we use a training set of images, which is usually in our case the half of the images to find that separating hyperplane, and then we use the rest half of the images to estimate accuracy of the classification. So we did that for in, in pairwise manner for uh, 12 different varieties, and we found that the average accuracy of classification was higher than 95%, which is very good, very good result. So um, here you can see the result of one run for the images of um, Lament and Nippenberg, the two very similar uh, rice varieties that I showed you before. And here on this image, each column uh, represents a feature that we computed, and the color bar on the right shows the value of those features. And each tiny row here represents an image participated in the classification. The dotted black line shows the position of the separating hyperplane. And all images are ordered with respect to the distance of, from the point in 16-dimensional space to the separating hyperplane. And the color bar here on the left uh, indicates the variety to which each particular image belongs. So here, looking at this color bar, you can see that uh, separating hyper, the hyperplane separates images almost perfectly. So for this particular run, accuracy of classification was nearly 100%. So this is a very, very positive result, which gave us kind of a green line to proceed into more profound shape analysis, because we know for fact now that there are some significant dif differences between even visually very similar root architectures. And um, 
So, <clears throat> I mentioned that um, our colleagues at Duke University, they grow rice and monitor the growth of rice uh, throughout 14, 14, days, uh, for 14 days of growth. And here you can see um, part of this time sequence data. And this is an imaging setup where we have uh, automatic turnable uh, table and we take images of, of the uh, cylinder uh, with rice plant inside. And the reason I'm interested in <laughs> this project is because the growth of root architecture is very heterogeneous both in space and time. So here you can see um, the, the results of 3D reconstruction of the root of the same plant with two days of difference in between. And as you can see in these two days, the right part of the root architecture grow, grew significantly when compared to the left part, which almost didn't change. Also, if you look at the, on this time sequence data, you can see that it seems that in the beginning, root develops much faster than at the end. So there is heterogeneity of, of, growth, of, of root development, both in time and space. And I'm interested in um, quantifying this local and also global uh, shape features uh, that would characterize this heterogeneity and also in, in trying to find the correspondence between different features in time so that we can compute dynamic descriptors which would describe how root develop develops. And, yes? Uh, the data, so they do like a CT scan every day? It's a big volume of data? No. Um, currently, we, we are working, we, we have just the 2D images that I showed you before. Mm -hmm. Current stuff has a little bit better quality of 2D images, and then they use 2D images to reconstruct um, to reconstruct 3D volume. Oh, okay. I know that on the previous, on, in the beginning of the project, um, our colleagues at Duke they tried to use X-ray machine, um, and that didn't um, produce good results. So this this uh, re volume reconstruction from images has better results. Mm -hmm. So if we, if we can compute dynamic shape descriptors, we can probably use, hopefully we can use a data-driven approach to reconstruct continuous process of root development. So currently I'm working on the first two steps of this project, and in the rest of my talk I will present preliminary results of, of, the, first, of the first part of this project. So before I do that, I would like to show you the data that we are working um, with. And 3D reconstruction of root architecture has very complex structure. And in addition, we have uh, also some uh, um, 3D reconstruction artifacts. We know for a fact that root can be represented uh, as a tree. It has tree structure. But in 3D reconstruction, we have self-occlusion which lead to, 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 to the presence of loops in the data. We also have noise and disconnected components, and we can have cavities. Uh. So, it's funny yeah. that, so you said the root structure is actually only the tree. They don't actually so it's it's yeah. But in, in 3D reconstructions, we have a lot of loops. So um, the first part that I'm interested in is in computing robust representation of the structure of the, of the shape. And in other words, I would like to have some um, skeleton representation of the shape. And this, this is useful because we can compute several um, features that are based on the skeleton. Like we can, uh, for example, assign different labels based on the type of the, of the root that each uh, segment in the graph represent, or we can use a uh, skeleton-based approach in order to um, quantify how structure of the root changes in time. So in order to do that, we use a spinning algorithm for skeleton extraction, and this algorithm works directly on the voxelized data, which is a format that we have right after uh, volume reconstruction techniques, 
and this algorithm iteratively removes uh, boundary voxels that wouldn't change topology of the object. So it's pretty easy, pretty easy to implement, but it's very sensitive to noise. So noisy, the uh, some noisy voxels on the surface would produce extraneous branches in the skeleton. So to overcome this pro this problem, we created a new filtering container to extract robust representation of the skeleton, robust, robust skeleton, which gives um, robust representation of the structure. And before I explain filtering criterion, I would like to look at the traditional distance measure that is used um, in order to extract skeletons or to compute medial surfaces and medial axes. Um, so this, this is the distance from some medial point to the closest distance on the boundary. And in 3D, this distance is equal to the maximum radius of, of a sphere that is completely enclosed, located at the medial point, which is completely enclosed inside, inside the shape. And the intersection of this sphere with the 3D object creates a two-dimensional loop, which will break as soon as we in increase the radius of this sphere. So in our approach, we used different distance. Uh, we used what, what we call erosion distance which informally measures how long will it take to erode from the boundary of a 3D object until a one voxel wide uh, skeleton. <coughs> now formally, this distance is equal to the maximum uh, radius of the sphere, such that intersection of the sphere with the 3D object creates a one-dimensional loop. And as soon as we increase this, the radius of the sphere, the loop will, will break. So in order to illustrate differences between these two, these two measures, I computed um, the, the <coughs> closest distance, the distance to the closest point, and the erosion distance for the skeleton, uh, for the skeleton points for this uh, sharp model. And as you can see, for the regions, uh, for the regions of dorsal, uh, dorsal fin, um, uh, the distance to the closest point produced very very low range of values. And this is because dorsal fin is very thin everywhere. It's very thin, but it, it has a lot of differences in the, between above and below part, where below part is much, much wider. And erosion distance captures, captures these differences much better because it, it can understand that eroding um, in this direction will take longer time than it eroding um, of the above part. Uh, so the filtering criterion is quite simple. It's based on, on the comparison of relative sizes of shape. And uh, more specifically, we compare this, the, the length of the branch in the skeleton with the relative size of the branching, uh, of the adjacent branching region. So here, erosion distance of the branching region is, is, is shown uh, with, as a radius of the pink circle, and if we scale it by some scaling factor, uh, we have this pink circle, and now the, the scaled version of the erosion distance is, is shown as a radius of the, of the blue circle. So according to, to, this, to our uh, filtering criterion, we will remove the branch below the branching region because the size of this branching region is smaller than the scaled version of the erosion distance while we keep the branch to the, to the right because it's much bigger. So this, is a pro this approach is very similar to, uh, is, is similar to the work uh, published this year in SIGGRAPH where the approach is, is used for <coughs> computing clean medial surfaces and they use the standard uh, distance to the closest point. Uh, here I want to show you some preliminary results and um, I, I plotted the number of the ending points in the, in the skeleton as a function of the scaling factor. So when you have scaling factor equal to zero, we have original uh, thinning skeleton which is very noisy. Um, and as we increase the scaling factor, we have cleaner and cleaner representation uh, of, of the structure, we have cleaner skeleton, and in this in this in this plot, we have we can observe 
plateaus of this graph which correspond to more prominent features of the shape which will survive over larger span um, of values of the scaling factor. And some more results here and I think more um, more interesting results is here in the middle where we do not actually observe uh, such big plateaus and this is because uh, the features of, of, this, of this model are all of variable size and we don't have specific very um, relatively prominent features they, they kind of all in similar range but we, for this particular example we found that using the, the value that we used for other models which is 1.75 works also well for this model we also tested the robustness of this technique to noise and these are some preliminary results here we perturbed the, the surface of, of, the, um, of the original model by different amount of noise and we computed the sequence of the scale axis and this is the original uh, skeleton which you can see is very noisy and as we increase the value of the scaling factor we have a uh, cleaner, cleaner representation uh, we also use the value of 1.75 uh, to look how this, this, the graph representation will change if we use different, um, if we add different amount of noise to the model. So here you can see the blue line shows um, the number of ending nodes in the original thinning skeleton, which tends to increase as we increase the amount of noise added to the image, whereas the scale, the scale axis has is, is very robust to different amounts of noise. So this is this is very positive <coughs> results, which gives us a guarantee that um, when using when using this approach uh, in analysis of time series data, we, we will have a guarantee that some features of the shape will not appear disappear randomly because this method is more robust to noise, and hopefully we will capture only significant significant features which will persist in time. So um, the next step that we are planning to do is to apply this method in order to compute some skeleton based features and also to use this representation of the structure in time series data analysis. So um, in my presentation I talked about two projects and I mentioned and showed at least some, some results um, on on several aspects of both of the projects, and some other aspects remain uh, remain to be part of future work, and which is um, also part of uh, motivation for for my future work. So, in conclusion, I want to show some some fields and applications that I, I find interesting. So, in particular, I'm interested in um, using machine learning techniques for uh, purposes of shape recognition and shape understanding. So in computer graphics domain, this problem is a little bit, is better developed. And it can be formulated as following. Given some shape, we hope that we can uh, segment it correctly into constituent components and then describe, have some shape des descriptor for each of the components and using um, finding the shape correspondence between annotated models and models that we want to annotate, we can infer labels of, of each of the components and then we, we can use a set of labels to understand what, what this object represents. So uh, in computational biology, the problem is quite similar, but I think it's more challenging because given some particular shape, we can compute a set of features but what we, we are, what we are ultimately interested in understanding is whether a plant with a given shape of root architecture will be, um, will be resistant to drought or will, will, be, will have a strong anchor. Another application is uh, shape matching for 3D modeling and specifically for some applications uh, of like footwear and clothes, clothes design. And again, as in previous example, in computer graphics uh, domain with application to 3D modeling, this 
this is a better developed problem where we can segment model and find the correspondence between, uh, between different parts and then just switch components and hopefully find a good um, deformation technique in order to match one segment to another so that we can model um, new models by just swapping components. And I mentioned, uh, I, I'm interested in particular applications of these problems like, um, like for example, footwear design. And the problem here can be stated as given particular shape of the foot and some interest in design, we want to deform the design so that it fits perfectly to the, to the given shape of the foot while preserving the design. So this is an ongoing, um, this is an ongoing research problem uh, for footwear industries and also industries that create um, especially medical or sport um, clothes. Another application um, that I'm interested in is in extraction, it is in designing robust methods for extracting networks uh, from 2D and 3D uh, biological and medical images. And I know that uh, this area is quite active, but uh, still automatic and robust um, methods are still need to be designed because data is very complex, usually has a lot of noise and um, missing parts to it. Um, another application is uh, that, that is of my interest is estimating similarity between large, uh, large networks. In this particular example, you can, you can see the uh, network of leaf venation. And um, of course, this network can be represent, represented as a graph, but I, I think that using just graph-based techniques like graph matching is useless here because these this networks are, are different and indeed they are, very, and they are very large so that would increase complexity of graph matching techniques. So instead of using graph matching techniques, I'm interested in finding patterns that would make, that would find um, distinct features of these large networks or patterns that, are, that these networks have in common. And finally, um, uh, if we observe the data, uh, the, the last application that I'm interested in is um, data-driven shape morphing to uh, data-driven approach to shape morphing and animation compression. And the idea is that if we can observe some process and we have some discrete, uh, discrete observation, the idea is to use uh, to learn the rules of this development process and to use, to use instead of imposing one or several specific uh, rules, we can use this, this rules that we learn from the data to have this data-driven approach to reconstruction of continuous uh, 3D process such as root development. So that, that concludes my talk. And I would like to thank people that I'm working um, currently uh, during my postdoctoral uh, research project and people that I worked uh, during my PhD. Thank you, and I'm ready for questions.
talking about psychometric talking about the roots application and you talked about this video axis with the with the erosion distance technique. I, maybe I'm missing it. Did you you I'm guessing you applied that on the roots as well. I already saw that applied on the on, on, on the model database. Um, I I'm wondering if when you applied it on the roots did you get rid of all these little little hairs that come off of the of the roots and <coughs> whether I apply the scale axis and more robust steps in the presentation to think on roots. And the question is that not yet, okay. because these are preliminary results. And uh, the question was basically in data management, because people that are generating the data, they, they still want to publish with their own. Generating the data before they can start results. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so have you looked at using the part of and then data to enforce the tree structure of all the loops? Yeah, this is, thank you, and this is a very good question. And this is what we are hope to do um, in time analysis data. We hope that if we can observe that on the previous, uh, on the early stage, where the structure is quite simple, we can, um, we see that there are no loops. As data develops, we can have loops and we hope that we can resolve those issues. Yeah, this is this is the idea. So do you have do you think you will have enough time resolution to achieve that? Um, so I think currently the highest the highest time resolution is one three year construction per day. Um, and I don't know exactly if that would be enough. So so what's the limit for that? Just because I mean could they run the system how long does it take to make I mean, fast, like probably around 40 minutes per, per 
I had seen some of this work a few years ago, and then I guess it, it took a toll on the roof to actually take the image. They couldn't take too many images because it, it was destroying the roof. Is that still the case now? Is that part of the problem? So we probably saw some preliminary results yeah. from, from the scene. From right, the right, right, yeah. So I think you you were talking about the, the the first preliminary result that they got while trying to use X-ray machine, where the root was growing in, um, yeah, it, 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 it was a lot of problems with this approach because they, they would throw the plant in the sand environment and then try to use X-ray to scan volume. But before using X-ray, um, machine can need to to suck all water out of the volume and they were using um, vacuum machines to, to get all water out of that and that would distract um, the roof. So okay. that didn't work very well. So with this approach, there is no damage to, to roots. So they can take more. Okay. Yeah. 